Your voice makes a difference. Don't ever think that just one voice doesn't. So at the end, they act, do something that's meaningful. This would take about 10 minutes. Don't take it for granted. Don't assume it's always going to be here. How much time would it take for you to send a message to your legislator to say, I believe in more conservation. I believe in Rawa. I believe in protecting our grasslands. Since 1936, the National Wildlife Federation has worked with hunters and anglers to pass the most important conservation laws of American history and to protect our sporting traditions. This podcast explores our history, our values, and the work we do to safeguard the fish and wildlife that fuel our passions. We are NWF Outdoors. Howdy, folks. This is Aaron Kindle, and welcome to the um, w- NWF Outdoors podcast. Excuse me. Uh, today, we're lucky, as we have been a lot lately, it seems. We've been getting some really great guests, but I'm, I'm really excited about our guest today uh, because he's a conservation veteran like, like few are. Uh, he's been through a lot of the interesting conservation battles over the years and, and come out on the other side happily and, and doing good stuff still. So we're happy to have him. Today we have Howard Vincent, Howard Vincent, excuse me, President and CEO of Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever. How's it going, Howard? Great. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm, I'm honored that you've chosen to spend some time with us. And first, we'll just tell folks a little bit about you, and then we'll, we'll jump into our discussion. Uh, as we said, Howard is the president and CEO of Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever. And uh, he's also on multiple different uh, boards of directors for in the conservation, hunting and angling space, Wildlife Management Institute, TRCP, Council to Advance Hunting and Shooting Sports. And uh, he's served now for how many years have you been the president and CEO over there? Oh, 21. I came in. Uh, uh, I've been with the organization 34 years now. Uh, came in as a director of finance, but in 2000. I became the CEO. So uh, Great. it's uh, at one level, it seems like, you know, five years and some days it seems like I've been here a hundred. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, good. And he's a Minnesotan and, you know, good, good country for pheasants, of course, as, as he will tell us about. And uh, he's just a, a veteran of a lot of different things that folks know about. So we'll touch on some of those. And first, Howard, we always we always talk a little bit about what we've been up to outside. So give us a little feel for for what you've been doing. Well, not yet. So, um, you know, for me, that hunting side, you know, I may only get out, you know, three, four times. Um, Travel is back on coming out of covid here a little bit. So uh, I'm on the road quite a bit. I'm typically, you know, on the road, you know. 100, 120 days a year. Wow. Um, but I am looking forward to the season. We've got a couple dates locked out here. I've got, I get to go down to northern, uh, northwest Iowa with uh, some of our state directors we're inviting in to talk quail for a number of days. And then we've got some events out in uh, South Dakota. So um, it's not a lot of hunting, but when I get to go, it's pretty spectacular. Excellent. Well, I hope, uh, I hope you get some good days of field this fall. I, uh, yeah, me too. I personally have been in a little bit of a lull between archery season and first rifle season here in Colorado. Uh, there's a two or so week period. My, I've been, my boy had archery tags, so we were working on that. And then uh, we are starting our rifle seasons here Saturday. And in between, he's been uh, competing in state mountain bike races. And uh, so every weekend has had something full. And we uh, spent some time this weekend sighting in, getting all already engaged up and and getting the truck ready so we're about to hit hit the woods and by the time this thing airs we'll be leaving here the next day so uh thanks thanks howard let's just jump in a bit and well first... then i'm gonna hunt vicariously through <laughs> <laughs> go ahead no i'm just saying i'm gonna hunt vicariously through you and your son then okay yeah i i do a lot of that myself uh so so good uh, let's just jump in a little bit on on the pheasant and quail situation this fall. You know, we've we've had some interesting conditions across the country. Uh, you know, some places drought and troublesome conditions, other places with tons of precip. 
why don't you just help us with a little bit of a general outlook and and then we'll start talking a little bit about you know how they're doing overall yeah absolutely you know it's it's mother nature can be troublesome and obviously this year is no different you know western we had incredible drought far east way too much rain uh, but in the end, in these middle states here, you know, in the pheasant range, uh, the Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, the numbers look uh, good. So they're, I think they're ticking up a little bit here. We had a pretty good uh, winter for birds, not a lot of heavy snow cover. So uh, they came through the winter in great shape. Uh, Kansas, Nebraska, are probably where they were last year. Uh, which were good numbers. Uh, the states that really got hit in the probably core pheasant, uh, North Dakota, Montana, heavy drought, uh, especially coming through into that nesting season, uh, triple digit temperatures on those eggs and those little ones. And so that's going to be kind of tough. But if, you know, every all hunters know that any area, you know, you're going to have your hot spots and you're going to have your you know, uh, low spots here. But uh, at the end of the day, South Dakota is always where you want to be. That's that's kind of a relative <laughs> statement. Yeah. If South Dakota is down 10, 20 percent, they still have more birds than anybody else on the planet. So uh, and then in the quail range, you know, again, that's so broad. You go from the southeast uh, quail range all the way out into, you know, through desert country and into the uh, west coast all the way up in, you know, California and valley quail. But we're, we're hearing good number, good reports out of Texas and Kansas. Uh, Nebraska's probably down a little bit, but they've been running on quail uh, kind of a decade high numbers there. So um, real positive in some uh, nice locations there. So, you know, pretty much across the bird range, we're hearing, you know, kind of good numbers, good, good anecdotal reports on uh, broods are seeing size of broods. Um, so, um, you're going to have to do your legwork. You can sure go out to our site, pheasantsforever.org, quailforever.org, look for the hunting forecast, and you can drill down right into your state. And many of those states are broken down into, you know, their their specific regions as well. So do your homework, and you can shoot a lot of birds this year. Good. That's good news. <clears throat> well, thank you. Let's talk about just generally the state of pheasants and quail you know, maybe give folks a little bit of background on how they're doing. What are the issues they're contending with? What's the conservation outlook? I think there's no better person on earth probably to ask than you. So why don't you just give us a little general overview well, on that? So, so we are, you know, we're focused. We're, as an organization, we're focused on habitat. So we don't raise and release birds. Uh, we're working on those grasslands out there. Um, so, you know, if we can raise a dollar, we'll drive that dollar into the ground. So um, the toolbox that we're looking at is typically comes out of the farm bill and the, con for example, uh, the Conservation Reserve Practice, CRP. And then there's a whole slew of other acronyms, EQIP, CSP. But at the end of the day, we're looking for, you know, how do we impact pheasants and quail wildlife? How do we impact uh, do good things for water, monarchs, uh, it all starts, you know, at that dirty end of the shovel. So as an organization this year, we had an incredible year. We set a record uh, and delivered 2.2 million acres of new habitat on the ground out there. So wow. that has a dramatic Thank effect. You. you need to put that habitat in place if you're waiting for Mother Nature to respond with the right amount of moisture, the right amount of heat, the right amount of, you know, winter, they'll respond dramatically. And that's what we need to be ready for. Um, so, you know, and then there's the bigger toolbox. And I know we'll talk about this, uh, but, you know, Congress. So if we deployed last year alone ourselves, you know, $80 million into that ground, the stroke of a pen in Washington, D.C. on Farm Bill, just CRP alone is $3 billion. And 20, we're currently at about 25 million acres of conservation reserve ground that formerly was corn or soybean or wheat. Uh, and it was non, really, it wasn't good farmland. It was non-productive uh, from an economic standpoint. This program allows landowners to um, come into a program, 
get some economic uh, benefit and then do something really great for wildlife. And again, soil, water, um, all wildlife. If you like deer hunting, CRP is the best thing out there. You like turkeys, CRP is the best thing out there on that landscape. And so it kind of rolls from there. So, you know, how big of a toolbox can we build? How fast can we deploy it? Uh, right now, we've got, you know, almost 300 professional, uh, both wildlife professionals and agri specialists out there on the land side, uh, landscape, working with farmers, working on public lands, you know, not only doing great things for habitat, but we have to make sure and hopefully that'll be open for access. Um, you know, the yeah. majority of the work is for us is on working farms and ranches, but we also love to add those components for, it's called VPA HIP, right? Voluntary public access programs that again, maybe that landowner would accept another $10 an acre and allow the broad general public to come hunt that property or enjoy that property, whether it's bird watching or, or shooting a pheasant or a quail and running that dog. So, um, you know, there's an incredible toolbox of conservation out there, an incredible number of partners. And, you know, to, to say we had a record year in habitat of 2.2 million acres, we had an incredible number of partners who helped us do that, uh, whether it's the Department of Agriculture with their Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, or whether that's our state Department of Natural Resources uh, that step up and help uh, and we deliver mission together. So um, I think the state of wildlife, um, where I, I believe we're on a cusp at this moment. And if we think broadly about where we are with the North American model of hunting and where we have been and where we're going, I think we're really on a tipping point right now. We need to decide uh, that we, we all need to double down. Uh, we need to find 11 more million hunters who are going to carry the torch forward here. Um, and that's honestly a challenge uh, out there in that landscape right now. It is, but I, <clears throat> I love your, I love your message. I love all that work you guys are doing. Just thank you for doing that. It's, it's critical and you know, it gets lost. I think sometimes people just want to hop up and head out and get to their habitat, get to their spot and go hunt. And I think for a, a, a chunk, I don't know what the chunk is, but for a chunk of, of sportsmen and women out there, that's kind of their engagement with it, you know? And I think these days, as you alluded to, you know, we, we need to get all those folks engaged and rolling and understanding this stuff and advocating for this stuff. So I appreciate that. And it's, it's probably a good segue too to, to talk about uh, the farm bill and CRP and this upcoming farm bill and, mm -hmm. and what the challenges are, why it's so important, kind of what it does. You, you started there a little bit about the farm bill, but maybe just do a one-on-one for folks who don't understand or, or aren't familiar with the farm bill and CRP, what they do, what they're designed to do and what, what we yeah. need of them. Yeah. So the farm bill is an incredibly large bill that moves through Congress uh, roughly every five years. And if you think about what makes up farm bill, the greatest percentage of those dollars, uh, 90 plus percent of those dollars are, if you think about a food lunch programs, uh, social uh, food programs, uh, commodity control, um, big agriculture. Um, a small, very small portion of that is the conservation title. And then in that bill, Title II is those conservation issues. And again, lots of acronyms in there. But at the end of the day, that flagship conservation tool is the CRP. Conservation Reserve Program. And at this moment, uh, we're working uh, under the 2018 Farm Bill, which uh, had a graded uh, cap on the number of acres that could come into the program. And the, right now, the ceiling's at 27 million acres, which is incredible. Um, we're currently uh, kind of floating around 25 million acres under uh, the program. But I believe that the demand out there uh, is 40 million acres. You know, we should be almost doubling this program if we're going to really impact all of the things we want to. And there's, you can stack the benefits of an acre of CRP and you can sure say, again, pheasants, quail, 
all wildlife, uh, building soils, holding water where it's supposed to be instead of losing it, you know, uh, losing those soils down the river, losing that chemical runoff uh, from farm fields. You can implement those with natural systems. And that's the thing we're talking about. We're talking about native prairie, buffers along streams, um, and all the benefits that come with that. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit before you go further, uh, you know, what exactly is CRP, you know, those landscapes, it's, it's a lot about keeping those areas natural, you know, not in, in uh, agriculture where it's actually row crops and things like that. Maybe explain what a typical CRP acre looks like. So, and this, and this would start with a a landowner, a farmer walking into their uh, USDA office, Department of Agriculture office and saying, look at, I, I grow beans and corn. I've got, you know, who knows, 200 acres, 500 acres, 1,000 acres. Um, What are some of the conservation programs that you have available? And where we have a person in that office, they'll point them to that Pheasants Forever employee, that Quail Forever employee. Our team then can sit down at the kitchen table with that farmer, look at their entire farm production and go, look at, you make money on these flat black acres. That's where the inputs of seed, chemical, gas, equipment make sense for growing corn. And believe me, our producers need to grow us food, fuel, and fiber, but not all acres are equal. And so there are acres on every farm, believe me, that should never be farmed. Um, The inputs that they put in, they don't make a profit on it. They actually lose money on it. This is where these type of programs can come in and they can apply what's called an EBI index, an environmental benefit index. If it's, uh, if the slope is too great and they have too much runoff, it's a highly erodible, the soil type isn't good enough to grow uh, crops effectively, the program will pay that landowner uh, a rate that's comparable to their local land rental rate. Um, So in Dry land, South Dakota, it might look like $100 in flat land, Iowa, it might look like $300 an acre. But the goal here is to take fa- acres that have been farmed that shouldn't have been, that are non-productive, and put them back into wildlife cover. And these are contracts that run 5, 10, 15 years, uh, and the benefit that you get from that. And at this moment, you get to stack on carbon sequestration, right? This is where carbon is supposed to stay in the soil. Um, If you think about the prairie land, uh, wildflowers, forbs, grasses, prairie grasses, those are deep rooted. Uh, You may see grass that's two, three feet high above the ground, and their root systems are 12, 14 feet below the ground. And that's where all that carbon gets sequestered. So there's so many benefits to this, to the broad public that are so relevant, whether you hunt or not, or whether you're a a downtown Denver or a downtown Minneapolis or Des Moines, um, the the benefits that are derived from CRP are just incredible. Um, Think about the, the runoff that comes through the core of the country in the Mississippi Valley Basin, right? There, the Mississippi Basin drains 30, I believe 36 states, and it all drains into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's where we have dead space, right? And uh, if we're gonna continue to put our soil and our chemicals downstream, that's going to be the end result. So, but we can have an impact. We can have natural systems that absorb and keep those uh, chemicals where they're supposed to be to grow crops. We can keep those grasslands intact. Um, so, so in a nutshell, this provides CRP provides dollars to landowners to help put back uh, natural grassland systems um, that never should have been farmed to begin with, but it does give them an economic benefit to make that, help them make that decision. And they need that. This is their land. This is their livelihood. Sure. And, and it's great when those landowners can help make that decision. Yeah. And I think uh, just to help people conceptualize that a little, if you can imagine, you know, monocrop for thousands of acres or, you know, some big chunk of land, and in there, there's some, you know, some gullies and some stuff like that that are 
not doing well for, for crops either. They're down a slope. And like you said, some other thing. And then you put them in this program. Next thing you know, you've got choke cherries and, <laughs> and wildflowers and other things that upland birds can come along and use, you know, other birds too, while migrating just, you know, all kinds of songbirds, you got deer, you got all kinds of things that can now come in there where before it was almost a, you know, a, a desert for them. And now they can utilize that. So it both helps them access other habitat. It provides habitat along the way, provides place for pollinators. I think it's one of the coolest programs. It's a little unsung, unfortunately, but it's, it's just, it's benefits just are yeah, so far and wide. Um, and, and the, <clears throat> Right. And our landowners have the tools to make these decisions. Um, I would say the majority of uh, farmers out there have on their equipment, all the information is being generated. So we call it precision agriculture. And so on every tractor, harvester, uh, piece of uh, equipment that delivers uh, necessary nitrogen and chemicals on that landscape, um, that equipment is tracking that. Um, we have a we have teams of precision agriculture specialists, uh, the, typically the co-ops, the retailers. Uh, this software is out there. Uh, and again, they can sit down you know, in, their, in their home, capture that information, and it'll tell them almost on a square meter basis where they're making money from beginning to end, whether from when they plant the seed to when they harvest uh, per bushel exactly where they're making money and where they're losing money. And those machines are equipped right now where when they move down the row the following year, uh, should that farmer choose, that machine is dropping seeds where he makes money and it stops dropping seeds where he loses money without uh, that wow, tractor slowing cool. down. And it's just amazing. And then during the harvest, that machine is also capturing where the exact kernel of corn came from, whether you're, you know, in that portion of the field where you're growing 200 bushels of corn, and then those edges where you're growing, you know, 50 bushels of corn, where you're losing money. So those abilities to make those decisions exist right now. These aren't coming. They've been here. And now how best we utilize those is one of our challenges as well. And those bodies that we have on the ground, those retailers, those cooperatives, the agronomists out there, they can help those producers make those decisions out there in a much better way. That's excellent. That's unique. I, I think that's a cool thing about, I guess, technology is helping us in that one. So Absolutely. that's cool. Well, let's talk too about, you know, so we're going to have another iteration of the farm bill here in 2023, about a year, year or so, year and a half. And yes. what's in it right now? Or what are we looking at? You know, what, what are we... What do we need out of that next iteration of the farm bill? And specifically with CRP, you talked about, you know, we think there's double the amount of acres out there that we could use. Um, there's a funding mechanism. There's an enrollment program. Just unpack that for us a little. What exactly we're looking for and hoping for? Yeah, so this is a classic Washington, D.C. battle. Um, there's an incredible amount of needs on the landscape or even within our social cut culture always. But our job and our mission is wildlife habitat, and we're going to go fight our fight. Uh, and again, we don't do anything by ourselves. Uh, we work really closely with our partners. Uh, and one of the biggest, best uh, groupings is the American Wildlife Conservation Partners. This is made up of 50 of the largest organizations, hunting, shooting organizations in the country. We get together uh, twice a year uh, and talk about how we can fight the fight. And then almost on a weekly basis, as we go fight battles in Washington, D.C., and it could be farm bill, it could be uh, forestry issues, fire management, uh, any, uh, and there's other acronyms, uh, Recovering American Outdoors Act. Uh, we're pushing hard now for a National Grasslands Act. So we get together, and I can sure bring Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever's 130,000 members but when we have the rest of the partners, ducks, turkeys, elk, the Federation, bring their membership, uh, we're representing 6 million plus hunters and shooters out there on that landscape. Uh, that, and we bring their voices to D.C. So looking at a 2023 farm bill, we're having those conversations right this minute. Uh, I just got off the phone earlier this morning with my governmental affairs team. Uh, they're already sitting down with both the 
House egg and Senate egg uh, staffers to talk, get ready for this a bill to be presented. We're going to push hard for 40 million acres at this moment. Now, how do we pay for it? And that same thing, we're going to have to go fight for it. Uh, there's a finite amount of dollars, of course, in Washington, D.C. So we're going to fight for what we think is important. Um, and then it's important for us to be to tell the story. And I think you kind of walk me into this about being, you know, what we do on this landscape, and not just Pheasants Forever Quail Fair, but all the wildlife organizations, is relevant beyond the hunting community. This is relevant to, yeah. if you drink water, um, if you take a bite of food that needs to be pollinated, and by the way, three out of five bites of food have to be pollinated. So you think about honeybees, all those pollinators, monarch butterflies, which are on a verge of being listed as an endangered species, are down to 10% of their historical population. If you like those things, everything we do on the landscape impacts those on a positive way. Everything we do on that landscape sequesters carbon, right? Uh, how can we be have a resilient landscape out there that we can compete and make this a better place for no matter where you live or where, whether you participate even in the outdoors. So telling that story and being relevant is a battle in Washington, D.C. So for a legislator to be from downtown New York City, what we do is important because where does New York City get out all of their water? They got to get it out of the Hudson watershed that flows down through protected forest lands. Um, and that's, a, that's an untold story. Right. You, the, the average yep. person in New York City does not think twice about turning on the tap and imagining that the wildlife community and the conservation community provided that water by protecting forests, by protecting those grasslands upstream in the Hudson Valley. Um, that's what this landscape should look like instead of having like Des Moines, they have denitrification plant. So they get their water out of the Des Moines River. Um, they spend a million dollars, $3 million a year to take the nitrogen out of the water that the egg system uh, flowed in. Wow. There should be natural systems to take care of that. And that's what we're fighting for in this farm bill. That's why we believe there's 40 million acres of opportunity along streams and rivers, along those highly erodible tracks. Uh, but it's going to be a fight for money. And it's going to be a fight for voices. So for us listeners uh, out there, uh, when the time comes, we're going to ask you to act. And that means make a phone call to your legislator. We're going to ask you to write a letter, um, send a text, uh, an email. Uh, if you have the ability when the, your legislator is back in your community, uh, pull them aside and tell them that you feel that conservation on the ground is critically important, that it is valuable um, this is bigger, again, this is bigger than hunting. Uh, but, you know, all of this, these conversations uh, need to be really focused, timely. Um, so uh, keep this in the back of your mind when you have these opportunities to uh, share your thoughts and what you think is important on that landscape. I love it. You're getting me fired up. You're getting me into wanting to go do something right now. <laughs> I like it. I like the passion. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> We've got plenty to work on right now. And it seems like the, the 23 Farm Bill is a long way out there. Uh, we're starting to draft it right now. Yeah. And so you'll see, you'll see this come out. But there's other battles to be fought here. Um, we just came out of probably one of the last uh, best years in the history of conservation from a funding standpoint. More got done in this last 12 to 18 months than has occurred in the last decade in total. The Great American Outdoors Act, PR Modernization Act, the ACE Act, uh, more money uh, got deployed to conservation uh, because these are things that you can't, uh, uh, the, the amount of jobs that are generated in the outdoor industry, the amount of uh, opportunity, um, quality of life benefits, these, are, these jobs can't be exported right? Our public lands, our refuges, private lands where uh, people can go hunt through open fields initiatives, uh, walk-in areas. All these things drive economics into our 
rural economies. Um, and again, these aren't dollars that are going to go away into other countries. These aren't jobs that are going to go to other countries. Uh, in fact, bottom line here, the hunting shooting community funds 80% of all conservation in America, right? Through when they buy licenses and then the Pittman Robertson excise tax, which means if you and only these four things generate money, this excise tax, 11, 12% from the manufacturer. If you buy a gun, ammo, a bow, or an arrow, those four things fund the Pittman Robertson at this moment to the extent of about $300 million annually that goes back to the states for wildlife conservation. Tack on that hunting license, that fishing license, um, that's what funds conservation. And so if we don't have quality habitat, if we don't have places to go to hunt and shoot, um, this is going to go away. And if you, you know, I'm going to keep going here. If, if you think about <laughs> this space, right, who's, who's hunting right now and who's shooting right now, who's participating, it's this perfect bell curve, if you can imagine. Perfect bell curve. At the top of that is 60-year-old, honestly, white males, Mm -hmm. who are funding this, that's only sustainable for the next 15 years. And then when we're 75, we're going to time out, right? And I'm that, I'm that poster child, right? So we not only need to replicate ourselves, we need to replicate ourselves in a broader community, right? We need to be inviting of the entire community, the hunting community, should be reflective of what our community looks like. So diversity and inclusion is important. Getting those millennials out there, uh, you know, yes, we want to invite those new young faces, those 12-year-olds. Um, that's great. But the 12-year-olds, honestly, aren't going to be here in time to save us. So we <laughs> need those 20 to 40-year-olds to really come to this sport, whether it's hunting or shooting. Uh, and the 60-year-old team, we're going to have to be those mentors. We're going to have to be um, welcoming and inviting and be a resource to bring that next, uh, those the plural, those next generations uh, with us into the field here. Otherwise, this will go away. And that's what's at risk right now. Um, and and we'll, we're, we are fighting for more dollars of conservation, for more acres, for quality habitat, to allow successful hunts to have wildlife on that landscape. Uh, but as importantly, we have to have access to it. Um, so, you know, uh, the last two administrations, access has been a priority, opening up public lands to more hunting uh, and fishing, which has been spectacular, but we still have a, a big fight ahead of us and a long fight ahead of us. I love it. You're firing on all cylinders there. I was, I've, I've had about, you know, five different things I was going to ask you about that were part of that, that little run you did there, but I'll try to get to the ones I can remember. First, uh, I, I, I liked a lot of what you were talking about habitat, right? And, and I think one thing that we've been trying to convey, for instance, you know, just this week, we released this, this climate report, it's called the Hunter and Angler's Guide to Climate Solutions uh, to Climate yes. Change Challenges, Solutions, and Opportunities. What we're really trying to say is we need to invest in the same things you're talking about: natural infrastructure. And I want to really highlight: invest. Invest yes. is what we're talking about. Invest means it pays something down the road, and these things absolutely do. Um, for every you know million dollars, you don't have to spend on pulling nitrogen out of the water. There for every you know, million dollars, you don't have to, to clean up a, a flood because you restored the river and had a wetland for some of that water to go into. For every, you know, ton of carbon you sequestered out in a restored grassland, all of those things are paying for themselves down the road and they're improving hunting and fishing. That's what I love about them so much. I get almost excited as you when I talk about it because those things have so many benefits across the whole spectrum that, that you really can't do it enough. And they are appropriate use of our funds. Uh, they're, they're a wise investment by our leaders and, and for us to advocate for. So I love your passion there. And then yeah. I was going to say one other thing about what you said, and that was, you know, 
We saw it during the pandemic, right? Almost a, a back to earth or whatever you want to call it movement. People going back to gardening yeah. and hunting and fishing and all of these things. And it's more family connection and it's more people that need places to hunt and fish. So you touched on access, you touched on habitat. All of these things are critical right now. And I believe, and I, my hopeful spirit says that they're pointing to a future where we both save hunting and fishing and keep it alive and keep it as part of our American traditions. And at the same time, we revive habitat and, and solve some of the climate crisis and deal with some of the biggest issues we have. So I'm hopeful like you. You got me fired up there when you started talking about it. I, I felt like well, we Aaron, were- I think you nailed it. <laughs> I think you nailed it. We need, you know, we've spent the last hundred plus years trying to accelerate water, right? Move water faster off the landscape, yeah. down rivers. Now we're in the reverse of that. We're, we need to figure out ways to slow water down. Um, and it is natural systems, right? We can't, uh, the, what's happened in the Gulf, uh, we can't put enough concrete in place to protect New Orleans. We need natural systems. We need those grasslands out in those shallow waters. That's what slows down uh, those tides. And upstream, uh, we've got to be putting clean water into the Gulf, right? not dirty water. So all of these things play, but we're, we're in the process of slowing water down. Let's keep it where it's supposed to be. If you're looking at this drought in the West, we want to hold the water on those landscapes to be able to, whether it's grow crops or provide enough uh, moisture to prevent catastrophic wildfires. I mean, all of this plays in, and this isn't this isn't rocket science. This is such a, you know, using natural systems, you know, and that's what kind of gets me fired up every single day. I, and I'm not a biologist. I'm not a wildlife professional, uh, egg professional, but uh, hanging out with the, the science, learning how really Mother Nature works. It's magic every single day how things are tied together, that if we protect our soils, we can actually grow soil so it's more healthy vibrant, to grow more crops, better crops, more bushels. And where you shouldn't be growing it, we can sequester carbon. We can take that out, put that in the ground. Um, if we don't manage our forests, that carbon in that is released, right? Young, healthy forests hold carbon. Old growth forests do not, right? A young tree versus an old tree, that dynamic is different. That science is there. We know how to manage this. Water is such an important part of that. There's places where trees shouldn't exist. You know, in the far west where uh, cedar and uh, juniper have started to, uh, start, started to grow up uh, in grasslands, whether that's tall, short grass prairies, um, never should have been in there in the first place. Uh, a juniper tree and a cedar tree out west where it shouldn't be is sucking up 35 gallons of water per day. One tree, 35 gallons of water today, it's turning what used to be a meadow and uh, grassland into a high plains desert with zero wildlife benefit. Um, we've got teams that are taking those trees down, returning it to um, grasslands the way it was originally meant to be in that landscape. Uh, and the meadows are coming back. And waters are start, water uh, intermittent streams are starting to flow again. So Mother Nature will take care of itself, and you'll love this. Instead of uh, managing those streams and creeks and re-engineering all the damage that was done, in these landscapes, they've added beavers back into yeah, that landscape I do love that. to slow water. I mean, uh, a couple pairs of beavers versus millions of dollars of concrete and engineering and equipment. And uh, you can imagine what would go into that to fix a stream if you had to go mechanically do it. We can fix this with natural systems, something as simple as a pair of beavers. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, it's exciting when these things make sense, they come together, uh, but it takes a moment to stop, think about it. What is the best path word? And you nailed it too. R investment, a return on investment. Holy cow. You know, and this should be forever. This is how we should move going forward here and find that balance. Um, these, these are exciting times. 
And now let's pause for a message from our partner podcast. Hey everyone, this is Marsha Brownlee from Artemis Sports Women. We know you love awesome stories about hunting, fishing, and conservation. So head on over to the Artemis Podcast. You'll meet adventurous, accomplished women who are redefining conservation through their lives in the field and on the water. Filled with humor, audacity, empathy, and intelligence, Artemis brings you new voices and introduces you to women from all walks of the sporting community. Find Artemis wherever you get your podcasts. Well, you got me fired up some more because, you know, <laughs> you're talking about so many things I care about and, and things that, that, you know, we at National Wildlife Federation and, and many of our partners like you folks and others are working yeah. on. We're doing a lot of we're doing a lot of beaver restoration projects. We have some pilot projects across Montana, yeah. on prairie streams and in high mountain areas. You know, you hold that water up there. It's fish habitat, waterfowl can land there and it holds, you know, yes. water longer into the summer. Just a lot of cool benefits, as you mentioned. But I think another one we we can't not talk about, Howard, is is the Grasslands Act. You know, we we're partnering with you guys and yeah. several other sporting and, and conservation organizations uh, to to write and promote this bill that is really designed to help restore the grasslands. It it models itself a little after uh, NACA, you know, yes. to where we can get some funds. The North American Wetlands Conservation Act where we can get some funds back on these really critical landscapes. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to give you the chance to just tell folks a little bit more about what it is, what it's designed to do. You know, the state of the grasslands, I think we're, it's something like 70% of all grasslands in the United States are, are gone now. Yes. Um, so it's not a, it's not a chicken little thing. It's not a, you know, we just want a, some more money for our hobbies or anything like that. It, it's a tough spot right now. And not only is it a tough spot for grasslands, the benefits when you take care of them are also just exponential and, and amazing. So I'll give you the chance to just tell us a, a little bit more about what that is, what it's designed to do and, and what we want out of it. All right. So what we're looking at is a National Grasslands Act. And what it would do would be to identify um, $350 million annually. That would not be a new tax. It would come out of uh, funds that currently exist from fines, um, from oil, gas. um, And it is modeled after what's called NACA, the North American Women's Conservation Act, which is at this moment about $50 million that... Uh, are deployed annually. Um, you have to submit for a grant. It goes out to partners. They Those partners have to match it one-to-one. So there's an incredible return uh, for our federal dollar out there on that landscape. And if so if NACA is $50 million, the Grasslands Act, we're asking for $350 million, which is uh, kind of prorated based on the amount of wetlands versus the amount of grasslands on the landscape. So this is seven, grasslands are seven times more uh, uh, available at this moment that we need to protect. Uh, And then recognize just since, boy, in the last 15 years, uh, we've lost 50 million acres of grasslands. So if you can picture in your mind, that's the size of Kansas. That's the size of Kansas that we've lost just in the last 15 years. Incredible, yeah. So... And again, if we want to, if you believe that we should be sequestering carbon, apply that to 50 million acres of lost and what we need to protect here. And so there's about 10 organizations that have come together to launch this initiative, the National Wildlife Federation, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, and a a host of others. Um, And we, uh, about uh, just prior to this, we... Uh, created a one-week hard push uh, up to the hill uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, each of our organizations uh, created a drum roll, uh, asked for an action item like I talked about early. When we ask you to act, we, we, we really mean it. It's, uh, we don't ask you to do this every single day. But when we do ask you, our members, our listeners, uh, our social media followers, act. In that one week, we had over 50,000 messages hit Washington, D.C. and uh, both the House and Senate. It it had an impact. 
we had an incredible number of legislators call us and say, boy, what is happening here? What is this bill? How can I be a part of this? So that's the action that we want. We think this has legs this year, 2021, that we can get this through Congress. Uh, and these are new dollars. These And the farm bill comes from the Department of Ag. And again, there's about $3 billion there that uh, funds the Conservation Reserve Program and so many other conservation practices. These dollars would be on the Department of Interior side and a whole new set of grasslands, both uh, public and private. Um, uh, if you think about where wildlife exists, it's just not on public lands. It's not on preserves and uh, state parks and national parks. It's on private land as well. So all of these things are hub and spokes. All of these are corridors. How do we create connectivity across this landscape? You know, not just for pheasants and quail, but for migrating uh, mule deer and elk and pronghorn. I mean, just again, it goes on and on the benefits, but looking at that landscape differently um, and, and grasslands, this isn't a Midwest thing. This is pineland savannas in the Southeast to sage steppe in the Northwest in the uh, sage grouse area. So everything applies here. You know, where should grass be on that landscape to benefit our, our entire, not only hunting shooting community, but our entire uh, population and uh, every every American out there will benefit from this. Yeah, and it's due time. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people think it's just a bunch of farms out there or something. You can't you can't do anything, or wildlife don't live there. It's not true for one, and for two, you know, every it, like you said, three or five bites come from pollinators. Uh, this is our food source is, is, is Americans. We want to support American farmers, obviously. Um, so we have to have something like this that, that really both celebrates the importance of this landscape. You know, we, it, unfortunately, it's been unsung and kind of just used up uh, yep. maybe in, in mis, misappropriate ways. But this is a chance. Yep. And so I, I love it. And let's let's talk about how maybe an average Joe or Jane can can help here. I know we have a, a website where folks can check this out, actforgrasslands.org. That's our community, you know, coalition that we launched that together where you can get a little bit more information. But maybe you can spell out, you know, how your members and other folks can get engaged here. Absolutely. You can go to that website uh, and you can go to pheasantsforever.org, quailforever.org. You can go to the uh, National Wildlife Federation site. Um, you can find out who your congressional representative is, whether that's in the House or the Senate, um, and send a note, to, uh, send a text. Um, they keep track of it. They have staffers in their offices that are tracking this every single day. Every notice that comes into their office, every touch, they keep track of that. Um, and that has a weight. So if their constituency um, tells them that, the Grasslands Act is important to them. They're going to start paying attention to that. Uh, and we need those numbers. Um, so it's this. We're, we're always a vote behind. This is not going to be an easy lift. You can add all the logic you want. You can uh, <laughs> talk about the economics, uh, the return on investment, that, uh, again, you can apply all the logic you want, and you can still lose the day. Uh, and, and we've learned that those tough lessons. So this is going to be a battle all the way to the vote. Um, and so every vote counts. Um, and, and again, being relevant, um, the things we're doing will be important to people who live in downtown New York or downtown LA. You don't think LA is being impacted by the fires in California? I mean, this is, this is in view of downtown Los Angeles. This is Santa Barbara. I mean, you can't breathe out there when those fires are underway. And you'd think that ocean would push that, you know, those winds inland and they don't. I mean, this is the, you talk about the health of a landscape or the health of your community. All of these things are in play and at risk. Um, so, you know, how do we hold soil instead of, you know, burning forests down and Honestly, a lot of that relates to not managing the forests. Um, there's this huge difference between conservation, which is the smart utilization of resources, versus this, I think, ignorant 
preservation, which don't touch it. Uh, we're way past this don't, don't touch mentality. There's, uh, these individuals and these groups who think we should uh, never touch a forest, which means it will burn down. You'll build such a fuel load and the wildlife benefits of that are almost zero. You need young, healthy forests to generate wildlife populations, birds, insects at every level. Uh, mammals, uh, it's these old growth forests that have done nothing uh, and they're just waiting to be burned down. They're waiting for that carbon to be released instead of utilizing those products. I mean, so in some of these areas, it is economics. It is, you know, is there an industry for these products? You know, whether that's uh, pine in the southeast or, you know, uh, cedar in the in the west here. So there's different dynamics, but there's a there's a logic and there's a science that we can apply to this and not just emotions. Um, that's gotten us, I, I think, into a lot of trouble in a lot of these geographies where emotion is played more and is more important than the science. Um, and that's frustrating. But that's why we need every one of your voices out there to beat the drum on using science, being smart, using your dollar appropriately, uh, and investing something that's meaningful and, and has a longer uh, a view than just pouring concrete or uh, not touching something because you think it's pretty. Um, nature is beautiful when it grows, uh, but when it's allowed to just die, that's a sad statement. Well, thanks for that. I think one other thing with, with grasslands, I mean, I, I, I don't think we can overstate the, the need to act. Um, you know, we just, we, as we mentioned, 70% grasslands are gone. Uh, we just saw the listing or the proposal to list the greater prairie chicken, a totally grassland dependent species. I think nobody really loves seeing species go on the endangered species list. It creates a lot of management complication. It creates, you know, it takes friends and makes some enemies sometimes where, you know, if you're, if you're interrupting someone's livelihood, a farmer or whatnot, and he's got habitat on his, on his land, you know, we need to incentivize him having yes. habitat on his land, not, not punish. And so I, I like that there's, there's a lot of neat things in our toolbox right now to address some of these things and, and folks are getting wise to it and promoting, you know, the wise use and the wise uh, conservation practices that we're, that we're talking about here. And so I, I really like that we're, we're starting to kind of, you know, it, it used to be just a couple things you did and now we're really expanding our repertoire and, and we'll talk about one more if you don't mind before I let you go. And that's for sure. Recovering America's Wildlife Act because yeah. it touches on this a little bit too. And for folks who listen to this podcast, they've heard me talk about this a little bit. It's a, a fund designed to help fund the uh, state wildlife action plans across the country, which are the plans for the species that are struggling a bit, you know, I, I would imagine the lesser prairie chicken is on multiple swaps, if, if you will, across the, across the Midwest. And it's really designed to help them so they don't have to go into that imperiled space. Um, and, and with that, you'll see a lot of benefit for all the other critters because it's really about habitat. It's really right. about improving their habitat, giving them uh, opportunities to carry out their life cycles and you've obviously been a big proponent in pheasants and, and quail have. So let's let's go over it one more time because we're, we're in a new space. We've changed it a little bit. Uh, similar to what you mentioned earlier, it used to be it gathered the revenue from offshore oil and gas uh, royalties. We've changed that a little to, to environmental fines is where the revenue comes from. Right. So right. if you get fined for uh, spilling oil, if you get fined for, I, I think even things like poaching, and I think yes. it, it covers the whole gamut of pretty much if you've committed an offense against natural resources, it goes in there. And uh, let's just talk about that a little, those changes. And, you know, the other thing I, I want people like you to do, and I ask every time is, Talk about the importance for the sporting community. You know, folks here, oh, the the warbler or something is going to benefit from this. I don't hunt that. You know, why should I care? Just unpack that a little. Yeah. So, I mean, we can use, you know, the, the short history here on the sage grouse. So about 10, 15 years yeah, ago, the sage grouse was identified as a species that was considered to be listing listed as an endangered species. What came together to protect that bird 
to find a path forward so so that bird would not be listed and and make no mistake about it the the hunting community and the broad public in general the landowners no one wants a bird listed that creates or, or any species listed obviously from the loss of the species but the cost to manage that that changes the dynamics so what happened with the sage grouse and this is 11 states in the northwest united states and they call it the big empty because if you drove through it you would see millions of acres of sagebrush and if you drove through it you wouldn't see anything you would assume that it's empty that there's no wildlife there it's not good for anything um, oil and gas thinks that's you know th that's a hot spot and it is there's a lot of oil and gas out there and there's no one pushing back saying that you know what is there the sage grouse was that poster child that allowed us to coalesce everyone in that space ranchers farmers uh, federal agencies, state agencies, nonprofit organizations to step up, build a plan forward on how we're going to save this bird. And in the end, we were successful. The Fish and Wildlife Service came back and said, this bird does not need to be listed as endangered because there's a plan forward to save it. Incredible. It, it, it couldn't have happened. I would say 10 years ago, even the players at the table wouldn't, couldn't have imagined that we could have done this together. So many diverse organizations who have been opposites, um, those private landowners who are willing to do work uh, to continue their ranching and their lifestyles. Bottom line, the day that the Fish and Wildlife Service said, we were not going to list this bird, um, there is a path forward that plan forward wasn't the sage grouse plan it became the sage step plan sage brush step plan because in that step is 350 other species that would have been at risk so you can sure hold up this one bird this sage grouse as this representation for 350 other endangered species because if you list that bird line up 350 other dominoes that we're now going to have to address on this landscape. That's magic, that happened, and that's how we're addressing, and this is really Rawa in a nutshell. Let's get ahead of this curve. Um, we're asking for you know $1.4 billion annually, and that seems like an incredible amount of money, but if you spread that over 50 states, and these monies are to go back to the states to address the state-specific needs, that's incredible. Um, because we can spend a dollar and prevent an, a, an extinction event from happening versus paying $100 tomorrow to try to do the same thing or bring that species back. That's the difference. I mean, we can either spend, you know, 1.4 billion annually, or we can send, try to spend a trillion dollars for something that we've already lost. That's what's at risk here. Um, there, a, a third of our bird species are at risk. Um, there's, we've got right now, there's an incredible movement through Congress. Uh, we're getting an incredible number of sponsors who are getting on this bill to support it. Um, at the end of the day, Make this call today. Uh, get on the phone. Say you support the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, RAWA. They'll know RAWA, right? Whether they're yeah. pro or con, yeah. they're going to know RAWA. We've been beating this drum uh, since the Blue Ribbon Panel brought this forward. Um, this isn't, again, this isn't a new tax. We're not asking you to support a new tax. This is coming out of penalties and fines. For people who have damaged the landscape, who have uh, done bad things, let's use those dollars for good things. So that's the, the vision forward here. Again, an incredible number of uh, uh, organizations uh, who believe in this. Are all, every one of our state Department of Natural Resources is all on board. Um, but we need everyone's voice. Um, don't let this one go. Uh, we're right on the cusp of making this happen. Uh, and the benefit is beyond measurable, not only to ground nesting birds or those at, at risk, but 
the birds that you love to hunt, whether it's waterfowl, upland birds, big game. This is this is lifting everybody's boat here, and, uh, and truly a healthier uh, space for our families to exercise the things that they love out there, uh, and then you know, and then drag a friend, right? And, <laughs> you know, a little bit earlier, right? We're yeah. uh, there's something called R three: recruit, retain, and reactivate. Right? How do we get yes. the current 11 million hunters to bring a friend, to bring a child, to bring a new face into the outdoors? Um, all of this is tied together because if you can bring them out and show them how critically important this is, maybe they'll make the vote. Maybe they'll make the call to a legislator. Maybe they'll tell a friend. Uh, we don't need a ripple effect here. We need a, a tsunami effect here to get some of these bills passed, whether it's the, Great, uh, the Grasslands Act, RAWA, when we ask you for the 23 Farm Bill uh, to make the call. Again, we don't do this lightly. The community, I know the Federation, uh, they're action oriented. So when they make your ask, act. I love it. I wish I, I, we could make a promotional video or something, Howard. I think you, <laughs> you got me one to do stuff. I like it. Um, uh, yeah, to just to cap that off, I mean, one of the things I say a lot is habitat equals opportunity. Right. And it's it's opportunity. And I, I think of it as kind of a hunting and fishing term. But the more I've kind of unpacked all these things and been working on them, it's beyond that. It's well beyond that. It's it's the opportunity to go see birds. It's the opportunity to have clean water. It's the opportunity to sequester carbon. It's it, if you create the habitat nature does these things for us it provides these services and we've known that we've unfortunately kind of neglected that and i think we're we're at this cool opportunity where we're both you know starting to celebrate that and, and give it the the respect it deserves and we have this opportunity to invest in it and and it can pay all these dividends so just just love it i, I think we touched on on some things that are really near and dear to both of our hearts and i think we want uh, our community to to, I, I say we have this obligation. You know, we have so much privilege. We can go out and chase pheasants and deer and elk and and grouse and all these things. What are we going to do with that privilege? You know, we we need to take that privilege and 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 protect it and take care of it and go advocate for for those landscapes because man, it'd be a sad thing to think that you know our kids or their kids couldn't go do some of these things because we failed to act right now. So. I appreciate all you're doing, Howard, and, and appreciate your time. And I know you got to run now. Do you want to leave us with any parting shots, any, anything else to fire us up and, and send us on our way? Um, just, you know, it, your voice makes a difference. Don't ever think that just one voice doesn't. Um, I would say 10% of the hunting community is a member of their chosen passion, whether it's ducks, turkeys, elk, pheasants, quail, right? Only about 10%. There's another 90 that, to your point, participate in these outdoors and maybe aren't paying attention. They think that this is a God-given right. And in North America and U.S., it is. But don't take it for granted. Don't assume it's always going to be here how much time would it take for you to send a message to your legislator uh, to say, I believe in more conservation. I believe in Rawa. I believe in protecting our grasslands. And, and I'm going to use this word too, just so everybody understands and, and don't lose sight of this. All of these programs, like the, uh, the Grasslands Act, the Farm Bill, these are voluntary programs. This is not government overreach. This is not government coming in to, you know, take, your, take land away and lock it up and put it away. These are voluntary programs that work with farmers and ranchers. Um, when it goes to government ownership, it's wildlife management areas that are open 365 days a year to the public, whether you want to go bird watch or whether you want to go hiking, uh, run your dog, ride your horse, uh, all of these, these. It's either public access or private lands that are voluntary for those uh, owners to make those decisions, whether they want to come into those programs. So this isn't overreach. Um, we need to protect the resources that we believe in. 
um, and that we love to. And coming out of COVID and the, the terrible things that happened to families and communities over this last year, um, one of those things that was surprising was people were trying to social distance and they went out fishing for the first time in a very long time. And we had record numbers of people participating in the outdoors. And I, they, they forgot how much they loved it. They forgot what was there. So we're gonna see a resurgence, I believe, in the outdoors. Um, so uh, be a mentor. Uh, let's keep those people participating in the outdoors. Let's keep driving that economic uh, rural, for those rural communities out there who need our support. Um, so at the end of the day, act. Do something that's meaningful. That we're not asking you to spend a year or lose your job or you know spend time away from <laughs> yeah. family. This would take about ten minutes, you know, beginning to end. Find your legislator. You can go to any one of our organizations online and find out who your legislator is. Send that note that you believe in conservation out there on that landscape. And here's some of the tools that we think that they should be supporting. And then. It, when it comes time to vote for those legislators, pay attention to how they voted. Did they believe in what you believed in, right? So we're all 501c3 nonprofit organizations. We're not allowed to say vote for him, vote for her, don't vote, but we can sure beat up the issues. So follow your issues, follow your passion, and make sure that those passions are addressed in your legislator. That's perfect. I love it. And I keep also saying that hunters and anglers are some of the best to be doing that because we're out there. We see the changes on the landscape. We know what needs to happen. We know what species are struggling, what ones are doing well. So take that knowledge, find one of our organizations and go get it done. And just thanks a ton, Howard. I Your, your passion, your enthusiasm, I love it. I'm fired up. I'm ready to go out and do something right now. So <laughs> thank you thanks. so much. Thank you for having me, Aaron. Have a great day and good luck to your son on his bike, those mountain bike races. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. We are NWF Outdoors.